Welcome to the workshop that will help you improve the way you use sources in your college essay. Before we begin the workshop, though, I want to tell you a quick fact about myself. When I was a little girl, I used to love braiding hair or rope or anything, yarn. When I braided rope, I loved the idea that I could take three separate things and weave them together to make something new. In many ways, this is how I see writing with sources in a college essay. You are weaving together information from other sources outside of yourself, but you're trying to do so in a way that makes something seamless and beautiful, like the braid you see on this slide in front of you. So at the heart of this workshop is to help you learn the moves that writers make so that when you are using direct quotes or paraphrases in your college essay, you do so in a seamless, beautiful way. So let's get started. So in this workshop, more specifically, you'll learn to avoid common problems when using direct quotes in your writing. You'll also learn other ways to use quotations and paraphrases in your own writing. And you'll gain a deeper, un deeper understanding of why experienced writers rely more on paraphrasing than they do on direct quotes. Before we start the workshop, though, I do need to let you know that these wonderful ideas in my workshop are from Bruce Bellinger's book, The Curious Researcher, A Guide to Writing Research Essays. For this workshop, I use the ninth edition, but I can tell you that any edition of this book is amazing. I would highly recommend anyone who is serious about learning to write research essays for college, I would recommend you invest in this book. So going forward, the ideas from this workshop, or in this workshop, come directly from Bruce Bellinger's book. The first thing Bruce Bellinger talks about in his book, um, when he talks about using quotations, is how to avoid the stop and plop quotation. This is one of the most common problems that new writers face when they're using quotations in their writing. So basically, the stop and plop is a quotation that is used in a sentence without introducing or citing the author with an in-text citation. So that's a problem for a number of reasons. Number one, it's kind of choppy. It's hard for your readers to go from a sentence that you wrote directly into a sentence that another person wrote. It makes it difficult for the readers to understand what you're trying to say. Okay, the other more serious reason why the stop and plop is not a good idea is because even though you are putting quotation marks around somebody else's ideas, you're not properly citing it or um, giving credit where credit is due. And that actually falls in the category of accidental plagiarism. So it's really important that you um, take the time to make sure you're not doing the stop and plop quotation move. <laughs> so um, basically the arrows on the screen show you that, uh oh, the writer did not introduce who is saying the quote. So we're not sure who's talking, who's saying that quote. We know it's a quote because there's quotation marks, but we don't know who is saying it or where the writer got the information from. And um, at the end, the writer forgets to include the in-text citation. So let me show you how to fix this one. So one way to fix the stop and plop is to, um, of course, introduce the quote. So you see on the slide here that the writer introduces a quote. So here is the writer's first sentence. We are using too much water to serve our own needs. And now here, the writer is transitioning into introducing the quote. So in his book, Your Water Footprint, The Shocking Facts About How Much Water We Use to Make Everyday Products, Stephen Leahy writes, you see right there, the person's using the title of the book and using the signal phrase, Stephen Leahy writes, comma, now we know exactly where this quote came from. And then the quote is carefully placed in the sentence. And at the end, you'll notice that just the number 23 is in parentheses. That's because the writer has introduced the author and the title of the book before they gave the quote. So there's no need to repeat the author's last name in the in-text citation. That's kind of an insider move that you can use in your writing as well. So take a moment and look at this slide carefully so that you understand how there's, this is one way to fix a stop and plop quotation. When you're ready, um, keep going. Okay, so another problem that Bruce Bellinger talks about in this book is called how to avoid the breadless sandwich quotation. And so the breadless sandwich quotation is a quotation that is used without any kind of commentary or analysis by the writer who's using the quote. I have to say in my many years of teaching, this is one of the probably the most common issues that writers have. So let me show you how you could possibly fix this one. So if the writer comments a bit more on why she's including Stephen Leahy in her essay before she uses a quote, then she will not have what Bellinger calls a breadless sandwich. So now notice how in the passage below, she's showing who Stephen Leahy is and why his insights are important before she uses his quote. 
So if you take a look at that paragraph, you'll notice that it's uh, a bit more improved than the one that you just previously saw, where the writer just simply introduced the author and the book. So notice how it changes. We're using too much water to serve our own needs. Environmental journalist Stephen Leahy has dedicated his career to raising awareness about our dangerous use of natural groundwater sources like lakes and aquifers. So this is great. Right here, she's introducing who Stephen Leahy is, establishing him as a credible source. And now she's going to move into why she's including his insights in this particular paragraph in her essay. So he argues that we are using these water resources too quickly. In his book, Your Water Footprint, the shocking facts about how much water we use to make everyday products, Stephen Leahy writes, even with seemingly vast sources of fresh water in such bodies of water like Lake Bakayal in Siberia, the deepest lake in the world, and Lake Superior, the largest, the amount of water we take is far more than what is replaced naturally. So you can see how in this one, the stop and plop is also greatly improved and so is a breadless sandwich because what's happening is the author is taking the time to fully introduce who her source is and why his insights are important before she gives us a quote. This is a great move that experienced writers make. So take some time to look at this slide and see how this move is improving her paragraph even more. And when you're ready, come on back to the video. Okay, so this is another common problem that I see in, in students writing and it's, it's, um, it's a hard one. So let me explain it to you. The kitchen sink quotation, you wanna avoid this one. This is when you have a very long quote in your paper um, that explains many ideas. And having a long quote in your essay is gonna overwhelm your readers because it's a lot of information for them to go through. So keep in mind that when someone's reading your essay, they haven't done all the research that you have done. So they're not as familiar with this topic as you are. So your job as a writer is to make sure that anything you put in your paper, any direct quote or any fact, um, any idea that you learned from one of your sources that you use in your paper, your job as a writer is to make sure your readers are comfortable with this idea. So simply placing a long quote in your paper, that's gonna make a lot of work for your readers. They have to wade through all that information, try to understand it, and then get back to understanding your point. So the best thing to do is to actually avoid long quotes in your paper. However, let me pause before I tell you how to fix the kitchen sink. I wanna take a side note to let you know that if you do find you want to use a long quote in your paper, MLA standards would have it that you need to block it. So blocking a long quote, um, a quote that is four lines or longer, it just means that you set it off as a block of text, just like you see there on the slide. So essentially it is a block of text that is tabbed twice. And you'll notice there's no quotation marks around this direct quote anymore. That's because when you block it off, um, it's, it's signaling to the reader that this is a direct quote. And then at the end of the uh, block is where you would put your in-text citation. Okay, I only need the number 23 there because if you look at the sentence before the block, you'll see that the writer has introduced in his book, Your Water Footprint, um, Stephen Leahy writes. Okay, so um, take a moment and look at this slide carefully so you understand what blocked quote looks like. So if you ever have to use a quote that's longer than four lines, this is how you establish it in your paper or how you set it up. Okay, when you're ready, keep going with the workshop. Okay. So let me get back to showing you how to fix a kitchen sink quotation. The biggest thing you can do to fix a kitchen sink quotation is to paraphrase most of the information in that long quote in your own words, and then only quote part of the long passage, as you see here in this paragraph, okay? So I want you to take a minute and read this paragraph. And as you are reading it, I want you to notice that the writer revises this paragraph by paraphrasing much of the long quote. And the reason why paraphrasing is important is because it allows the writer to maintain her voice. And this makes it a lot easier for your readers to understand the material. And you'll notice she only quotes one sentence out of the huge long quote that she had used on the previous slide. Now she's only using one sentence because she's paraphrased all the other information. The other thing I want you to notice is that she is citing her paraphrase, right? So right there, she's citing Leahy 23, even though she is stating these words, uh, the ideas into her own words, these are ideas she learned from Stephen Leahy. So she, even though she's paraphrasing, she's going to be making sure she cites his information by giving us that in-text citation. So take a moment, read over 
this paragraph and see how the writer has transformed it by using paraphrasing and then quoting sparingly. And now she is no longer uh, using the kitchen sink quotation problem in her paper. Okay, so take a moment, pause and read this paragraph so you get a feel for how the writer has fixed the problem of the kitchen sink quotation in her paper. And when you're ready, come on back to the video. Okay, so now that you've learned a little bit about how to avoid some of the common problems, the stop and plop and the kitchen sink, um, I wanted to give you a few more pointers too. Um, the more experience you get with writing um, with sources, the more moves you want to have in your back pocket. And one of the best moves I know of is using blending or grafting with, with integrating your direct quotes. So you'll see an example of that down here. It's when you take a quote and you blend it into a sentence that you're writing. So it's almost like half the sentence is you writing and the other half is the, the source talking. So if you look at that example on the slide here, where it says, I worry about our overuse of freshwater resources. For as Leahy says, one certainty is uncertainty. The future of our freshwater supplies is perilous. And then at the end, I have 23. If for some reason I did not mention Leahy's name, at the end of that sentence, I would have to put Leahy 23 as my in-text citation. So grafting quotes is when you take pieces of the quote or you um, insert a full quote in the middle of a sentence that you are writing. Okay, so take a look at that as one of your strategies for blending your quotes in. And when you're ready, go ahead and move on in the video. Okay, so this is probably the most important tip for writing with sources. So that's why I have it all in caps, paraphrase more. An experienced writer will tell you that you should use direct quotes sparingly. And I know you're thinking, wait a minute, I just spent a bunch of time in class learning how to integrate a direct quote. Um, it's true, you did. And the skills of learning to integrate a direct quote using the five steps is critical for English Comp 1. But now that you know how to use the five steps, you need to learn what experienced writers know. The most effective way to use any information you learn from a source in your own essay is to paraphrase this information into your own words. And this is why. If you can accurately paraphrase the information you learned, you have reached a deeper level of understanding and expertise than another writer who relies only on direct quotes. This makes a huge impact on your paper. It allows you to sound like you know you've learned this information and you can write about it with some authority. It also allows your voice to be the main voice in your paper. And this is important for your readers because your readers trust you the most, the writer, the person who's writing the essay. So they're trusting you and relying on you to convey the information in a way that they will understand. So paraphrasing is key. So as you are moving forward in writing your essay and revising your essays for college, remember that important tip, paraphrase more. Okay, when you're ready, keep on going on the workshop. You're almost done. Okay, so here's the final word. Learning to write with sources takes time and practice. Read other source-based essays as often as you can and notice how writers use their sources. Pay attention to when other writers use quotes and why, when they uh, use paraphrases and how often, you'll see that they use it a lot, and when they use more than one source to develop a paragraph. And notice how they cite this information with in-text citations that refer readers back to their work cited page. The bottom line is this. You want your source-based essay to sound like you. You want your voice to be the consistent voice in the paper. So carefully integrate your direct quotes and rely on paraphrasing more and more and more. Okay, I hope these tips have helped you. Good luck revising and writing your college essays. Bye.